All right. I would like to introduce for the next talk Daniel Yu, uh, his um, co-speaker. Unfortunately, couldn't make it due to health issues. Um, we wish all the best to him. Uh, he will give the missing machine learning lecture before starting in industry. So he will talk to you and give all the tips that you uh, will not have received uh, if you have only attended the lectures of Professor Buhmann or Professor Krause. He will share his experience from starting in the industry and all the pitfalls. I enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, David. Okay, also from my side, thank you very much for being here, everybody, especially the people here and also all the people over YouTube. So, what do we talk today? We will talk about everything which you didn't learn during the lectures at the ETH in the field of machine learning. <laughs> or let's not everything, but some aspect of it. So my name is Daniel Yu. Sadly, my co-speaker Dominic he couldn't make it as he's not feeling that well today. So we wish him all the best. Um, my name is Daniel Yu. I'm a senior consultant at IPT in the field of AI and data. That means we consult Swiss companies to how to take the next step to data-driven applications and also hopefully then self-learning systems. My background is also from here, from the ETH. I studied computer science um, and finished my master in 2017. And ever since then, I'm focusing in the whole machine learning field. And uh, today, it's, well, how I earn my money. <laughs> OK, so we thought about bringing you five aspects in the field of machine learning, what you need, which is not taught here at the ETH. What do you need to, well, to successfully bring a machine learning model into the industry? The first thing we would like to talk about is, well, as you all know, you need to manage your expectation. And for that, I would like to tell you the story of Dominic. So he finished his studies in 2013, also here at ETH, uh, doing robotics master. And of course, after, well, the ETH, you are looking for a top job in the industry. And he was looking for a job for in the robotics field. And one of the best company at that time was the company in German called KUKA. And there was this upcoming event where the robot KUKA is playing against one of the top German table tennis players. You know. And this project was quite exciting because it involves a lot of AI technology in there. You need, well, computer vision to see the, where the ball is heading. You need some prediction but, um, to calculate how you want to, well, play it back. And also you need this whole motion planning and this whole motion path, a lot of AI technology. And he thought, well, this is probably the best way how to start in the industry, because it involves first AI, and second, uh, his master, what he's doing during his master, building robots. Uh, he even uh, left everything behind in Switzerland and moved to Germany to join this company, just to find out that this thing was only a marketing stunt. The only video where they released was this in his opinion, quite bad CGI of this robot playing against this German table tennis player. So you can imagine how devastated he was. Um, and also the work is not, well, they are not doing that much machine learning because robotics is more about still more about just uh, programming microcontrollers. Um, so what he would like to tell you is, that you still need to manage your expectation about the AI. Um, the industry is la currently laboring a lot of the things with AI, even if there's no artificial intelligence in it. And the same thing goes the other way around, right? Not only manage your expectation, you just also need to manage their expectation. This is a Gartner hype cycle. If you've ever seen one of them, uh, how, how it is work is that in the beginning, well, everything is, the expectations are quite high, and then someone it will fall down to the uh, f fruit of disillusionment. And you see most of the technology in AI is still in this, um, well, 
top point of, of the hype cycle, which means that the manager has quite high expectation what you need to reach. And that's why, well, you still need to uh, manage the expectation of the managers because most of the managers will associate artificial intelligence, something like that, right? This magical thing which can learn everything. Um, so just be, <coughs> just be careful that you are not, well, that they are not expecting too much from you when you do machine learning. Okay. The next thing we want to talk about is about enterprise readiness. Um, well, for me, it was a quite steep learning because at the ETH, it's more the emphasis on, well, pushing the uh, state of the art and, well, train the model better than ever before. And that's not the same as in the industry. Um, <clears throat> I hope probably you have still the same expectation, right? Uh, if you want to go to the industry, what do you expect? Well, in my case, I expected that I, I would concentrate on, I get the data set, try to do a model, make the best model possible, and after that, showing that it's working, and um, give that to an engineer which um, deployed the system. The problem with that is there's still a huge gap between how we build model here at ETH and how the industry is building models. And one of the problems has to do with this tool. Oh. This one. <laughs> so who is using a notebook to train the model? Yeah? Nobody else? <laughs> what are the other guys using? No one? <laughs> um, so if you guys are not familiar with that, this is like uh, a data science environment where you can train models. Um, the problem with that is usually the Jupyter Notebook is just running locally on your computer. So whatever you do is working fine on your computer, which is not the same as um, an enterprise-ready code. And to illustrate that, that how enterprise-ready looks like, I want to show you a small architecture. So just, just that you will see that you need way more systems than just this notebook. Okay, what you have here is a line where you have the online world, which is like the productive system, the operational side. And then you have this offline side, which is more about the, uh, all the data history, all the, well, here's where you do your data science. What you usually have is something um, like a streaming service. Usually the incoming data is coming in as a data stream. And what you need for that is some kind of stream engine that you can capture such data and save that in some sort of, a, for example, a data lake where you can keep a history of all the data which is streamed in. This is called ingestion, and this stream engine is usually writing to a data lake, which is on the offline side, because the data lake is not part of the operational system. And from there, you probably need some sort of pre-processing or some cleaning of the data, because the data is usually quite messy, and you want to get that to, well, uh, a, a state with high, high quality. And that's what we usually refer as a training set. That's where uh, usually at the ETH, where we, where we start training models. Okay, now you take a notebook, which is your data science workbench, take this data in from the training set, and do uh, the same thing what you learned here at the ETH, right? Train a model, hypertune them, show that the model is working very well. From there. But this is something which usually, usually is only running on your computer locally or on some team server. How do you bring that into the production, into the online world? Well, you need some kind of model repository. Because usually today, the data science, not, it's not done by yourself, it's done by a whole team. And you need some kind of compatibility between the model you did 
and the model from the other, which means that you need some kind of tool which you can save all this model. This kind of model repository just not it's not only saving the model itself, it's also saving the data you use, the code you use, or which parameter and what you score at, uh, what score you get at the end. So from here, you can then build some kind of model deployment um, pipeline where you can put such model into uh, production on the prediction server. Now there's still a gap between your production server to the stream engine. And there you need to ensure that the pre-processing co pre code which you use is used as well here online. Otherwise you cannot well feed the data to your model. And from there, you can then make predictions and output the data again. You are still not done. After putting a model into production, you still need to, um, <clears throat> you still need to monitor it, right? You have to look for drifts, you have to look for biases, and that's also something which you probably need to set up. You need to look into these predictions, you need to sample the predictions and look into them if there's a, any problem uh, in the online system. So, this is an example architecture, a toy architecture, that so should show you that, well, what you learn here with the notebook is just a small part of machine learning. To bring the model into the enterprise world, there you still need a lot of other systems. Okay, the next thing which I want to talk about is, well, why is this so hard, right? It doesn't look that hard building such a system. The hard thing is not only on the technical side, but also, let's say, uh, it has some culture clashes because the data science world and the software engineer or the DevOps world, are, uh, there's a big gap in between. And there are several reasons for that. Uh, for example, we are using, well, uh, different languages, we are using different tools, and also the approach is totally different. From a data science perspective, I'm more, well, doing experiments, while the, uh, while the software engineer want more, well, have some, probably some uh, scrum ceremony to push the software forward. Also, in the data science world, we are more about metrics. We want to, well, uh, make the accuracy better. And on the software engineer world, there's no metric, there's just how many features you can deliver, right? And you see, also in the data science world, there's, there's not this notion of a bug. There are only SKUs, right, which you need to monitor, because bugs, uh, mo the model will always return an answer, if in, even if it's completely wrong, and that's something you need to look for. You see, these two words are two different words. And now, with machine learning or AI, which we want to bring into production, we need to somehow merge these two words, which is not that straightforward. OK. The next advice we can give is don't re re reinvent the wheel. Uh, that's a quite good story. Um, that's something probably you are quite familiar with if you're doing machine learning. This is the propagation code um, for a neural network. Um, because in the academia, it's all about, well, new algorithm, how to push the boundary, how to make things better. But in the industry, usually you are, you are not employed to, well, um, do state-of-the-art stuff, you should more reuse stuff which is already here. And there was this one story where <laughs> uh, someone was tasked to do a machine learning code, of course using neural network, and his deep learning code in the afternoon, he implemented the whole backpropagation by himself in Python, which is by the way, quite impressive if you can do that, but highly unnecessary in 2020. <laughs> um, so if you are academia, well, it's fine if you do that, but industry, please, 
usually if you have any machine learning problem, you are either not the first and not, uh, for sure not the only one. Just Google the stuff and, well, <laughs> copy paste what, what is already there. But sometimes it makes sense to reinvent the wheel, especially when the wheel is your business. So this is an example from a telecommunication company who really trained their uh, speech model. Uh, speech modeling is something which is, well, already done in academia several times for all the possible languages. But for this telecommunication company, it was, well, they were building a speech recognition software for Swiss German, which is kind of a hard thing to do because German's already hard to do and Swiss German even more. But for this example, well, they, they really trained their own model and they have their own research team doing that. The question is why? Why would they do that? As you know, telecommunication in Switzerland is, well, a dying uh, industry as you can not um, earning that much money with, with uh, cell phone subscription anymore, so they need to pivot. And they are hoping that when they can learn Swiss German, that they can sell the model or sell the model as a service. So here's a really good example when you should reinvent the wheel, when the wheel is your business. Okay. The next thing which you should consider is the human factor. There's this term which is called this chasm, right? This is the gap between when new technology is adopted by the majority. Have you guys ever seen this graph? So what, how this is working is for every new technology, it has to go through uh, this graph. At the beginning, you have some innovators who's trying this new technology, then you have early adopter, and in between you have this chasm. It takes a long time before the majority is using this new technology. And for AI or for machine learning, we are still here at the early adopter. And we are sometimes forgetting that we are the early adopter. As at the ETH, we are surrounded by early adopters. Um, but in the industry, well, it just takes time to cross this, cha this chasm. And sometimes, well, I really feel like to push the people down this chasm. But, um, well, that's probably not a good strategy. Especially because, well, the, the client usually feels overwhelmed with about if, uh, when it's about a new technology or complex technology. They are getting confused. And the worst thing you can do um, in the industry is, well, losing their trust. The problem is that business, well, it's still a game. <laughs> and you need to play the game right and know the rules. And one of the rules is, well, still about politics. So once you lose their trust, even if you afterwards could build a solution, which is very well, your customer will still not use, use it because uh, they, they do not trust you. So the best thing you can do is, well, you still need to cross the chasm, but you have to cross them with them. So have patience, take them to a journey, and, well, um, show them the amazing world of machine learning. Okay. Then let's take about the bigger picture. I know we are engineers. We are the number guys. <laughs> Everything we want to do usually is, well, climb the ladder and get the better accuracy, make the model best better. So for us, it's usually a quite narrow view. We want to climb this number ladder about um, the metrics of our model, but usually the ladder, some, or sometimes the ladder, is going nowhere. Because, and this usually happens when we do not understand the business. Uh, it's a classical problem of over-engineering, and I face that quite a few times where I was just too focused on the technical side instead of um, learning about how the business is working. So I still remember once that I introduced a way too much complex model 
for a quite simple problem, which, in yes, increased accuracy by two, whole 2%, two but it was unnecessary, because in the whole picture, the 2% in marketing does nothing. Um, so, if you are building models, you need, you really need to know the bigger picture, otherwise, well, you will um, improve models, which is uh, later not really used. Okay. So, in summary. We talked now about these five points about, well, managing expectation, not, but, uh, not only yours, but also theirs. We talked about enterprise readiness that, well, from the academia to the industry, you still need a lot of things before something is enterprise ready. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, that's something which you can do here at the ETH, but uh, not in the industry. Consider the human factor. New technology still takes time and know the bigger picture so you understand the business. Okay. So, why are you here? Switzerland still needs you. Um, I mean, AI yeah, and the whole machine learning is quite exciting, but what Switzerland really needs is, well, it's a new technology. It's, it's a really complex technology, so they need people who understand that, who have the skill, and of course, they need the people who actually do that, and that's where you play, um, <clears throat> where you come into the game. Well, you can either join one of the Swiss company and help them, or join our company, IPT. What we are doing, we are a consulting firm, which uh, have now, I think, one, 135 people uh, focusing on this area, and one of the big areas, of course, is AI and data. We have a lot of, lot of the ETH people, so if you want to join us, talk one to a one of our HR representative down there. Okay. Thank you very much. For listening hopefully that was interesting for you and if you have any question please ask thank you very much daniel it was very interesting i for one learned a lot so do we have any questions or first reminder to the people online uh, ask questions on slido uh, link in the description uh, and room blue we're in room blue uh, room red will be confused by your questions. <laughs> um, and also, they're not done yet. So, in questions in the room. Yes. Let's take the closer one first. Okay. So, you talked about this chasm. Of, yes. Um, like in the uh, adoption. And I'm wondering, you talked about the... Mm, problem with the uh, software DevOps um, kind of people. But I think a lot of these like implementation uh, hurdles are probably from management. So like, what is, in your opinion, the single biggest hurdle there towards like getting more machine learning into the industry? Um, I think one of the big problems, well, you have to know that IPT is uh, Switzerland-based, and I think one of the bigger problems here in Switzerland is that the business is quite conservative. We are usually not the first mover, and for sure uh, not the early adopters, so probably if it's about new technology, Swiss people are probably here somewhere in the late majority. We wait and see how it's working at other companies before we try it ourselves, and that is not helping that much. The other problem is, well, um, it's probably also from the business side, right? To cross this chasm, you still need to invest a lot of uh, new stuff, especially if you think about this new ar architecture, right? Um, you need to introduce a lot of stuff before you can even run your first small model. And this usually does not, well, it's not that profitable for the first use case. And for that, you need to, well, think in the long term, which is usually not done. Uh, and also, it needs some kind of people in the business who has this vision, you know, how, how the business will look like in, well, five to ten years. But this vision, uh, it's hard if the people are not understanding what AI is really doing. Does this answer your question? Okay.
So you gave us some very good tips for uh, starting an industry in machine learning in in kind of your position. Mm -hmm. Is it all just um, experience-based, like the insights you got, or did something here at ETH or what you did outside of your job already help you uh, to get these insights? You mean these insights in this slide? Yes, just this in entire uh, presentation. Ah, yeah. Is it all experience-based or...? Yeah, it's, it's this, this presentation is based on the experiences of Dominic and I, what we encounter in the industry, and usually it's about stuff which still amazes us today that, that the business is not doing. Any more questions? Ah, there is a question from the internet. Sure. Maybe as a quick reminder for those watching online, you can uh, click on the Slido link under the video. We have one question. Mm -hmm. Did Corona change anything in the topics that you presented because technology is seen different in Corona times, I guess? Okay. Mm. For machine learning, probably not, right? The coronavirus is pushing the people to, well, using digital services. But this is more the step of digitalization. This is what we here are talking about is the next step. We first need the digitalization to, to even have this. So, um, well, it, it, will, it will probably help down the line after a few years, but just not today. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Round two. Um, <laughs> in, your, in your opinion, your experience, so I don't know what uh, industries you work with, but I'm interested in your opinion on where do you think Swiss companies in particular are missing out by being like late in um, adopting machine learning. So like, where do you see the biggest unrealized potential? Mm -hmm. Good question. I think, well, if you think about machine learning, how, how this usually used, usually it's either about the scaling, which is uh, not relevant for Switzerland because we do not have that many people. The market is quite small. And the other thing is more about uh, efficiency. You use machine learning so you are more efficient. Um, probably if you look at the finance and the insurance company, most of the stuff can be more efficient if you adopt all these machine learning technologies. Uh, but it will take time and also they need to invest for years before they can, well, get, um, get, uh, get the good thing about the machine learning part. Uh, and probably, but that, that's a Swiss thing, right? You just wait until all the other are doing, and then you will try to adapt such thing. Um, so yes, they will miss out on some efficiency, but as, especially for insurance, as the Swiss market is, well, quite small and quite protected, uh, there's not that many, much risk to not to do that, right? You just wait um, until somebody's moving first. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Well, it does not seem to be the case. Um, or there is a question from the internet. In the time you walked here, it's even two questions by now. Oh, uh, how important is visualization in corporate data science? Can you uh, say it again? How important is visualization? Like visualization. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk about data science, yes, a lot. Um, if it's well, usually data science is not only about machine learning. Usually, it's also about well improving the business. And how do you improve business? You need to show how the business is doing, and this this. Showing is usually done with visual visualization. If you talk about machine learning, well, you do not 
usually do not need visualization. If it's an efficiency case, you just show that you are more efficient. And that's something you, which you need to calculate from a business perspective that you can, well, either be more effective or earn more money out of it. So the next question is, uh, why should we do ML in the industry and not in academia? Me personally, or? <laughs> Uh, I mean, that there are good reasons to, well, uh, continue your study in the, or to, um, have a career in the academia because these people are really pushing the technology to the next level. But what excites me personally to be in the industry is like to help the people to catch up with this, all this technology. Um, what I really like is, you know, when they have this aha effect, how this is working. This, this, this stuff excites me, and that's why I choose the industry route. Okay, the questions keep on coming. Um, <laughs> some people believe that ML hype will fade in the next years. Others think it will continue to grow. In your opinion and in your experience, what do you think it will happen? Well, I hope that it will still keep growing, of course. <laughs> but um, there's definitely a shift, right? Now with all these cloud technologies, usually you are not train your model yourself. You are using some model which is already trained by the big corporation. For example, for, for, for this project, well, the, the, the German speech recognition part was, uh, is, is on Azure. They are using the Azure custom speech. I think it's called Azure, Azure as custom speech. So it will now shift more on using the right service instead of, um, well, train it yourself. So I don't think that it will go away, but it will transform for sure. Okay, so the last question so far from the internet. Can you give us some examples of the customers you have advised so far? What are they trying to achieve uh, and what uh, would you advise them in general? Examples? Oh, well, there's a lot. Um, well, for now, you need to find like a business case which will, well, where they have this immediate effect. Otherwise, well, they will not see how, why you should use uh, machine learning. And one of the things which you can do is either, well, automate stuff, which you have a little bit of, uh, of intelligence. For example, uh, the customer onboarding, um, which you need to guide through some steps. And there you can, well, use some intelligence, enrich the experience with some intelligence. The other part which you do a lot is um, in the marketing space. Well, the marketing today is still done heavily manually. So there are these marketeers who choose, you know, which people to contact and then they write this email. This can be done better with machine learning for sure, where you do this, um, well, for example, the customer segmentation or to try to cluster them or even find uh, what, which tags you want to send to who at which time. So that's the thing which you can try to solve with machine learning, which I already tried. And some of them works really, really, really well, where you, where you have this immediate effect. Well, thanks a lot. There are no more questions online. Are there any more questions in the room? Well, if not... I would like to very much thank you. I would like to very much thank you. Um, and hand you our extra special FISCON Digital Cup uh, with some sweets inside. Um, and also there's one for Dominic. Uh, hope So he hopefully gets better. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for sticking with us even through tough times.